Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you a closer look at the performance from this Voigtlander APO Lanthar, Apochromatic Lanthar Macro 65mm f2 lens. And so we've already examined in our first look episode the build and the design. This is a beautifully constructed lens that feels a lot like a classic Zeiss lens in terms of uh, both its you know physical construction and then also its mechanical operation. Now today we're going to take a closer look at the actual performance. So we're going to take a look at a number of things. We're going to look at its resolution and contrast, color rendition, we'll look at its bokeh quality, and what I refer to as the overall rendering from the lens. Um, chromatic aberration, flare resistance, lots of stuff. So let's jump in and let's take a look how this lens holds up, particularly when compared to some very strong competitors in the Sony Zeiss Planar 50mm f1.4 and then the incredible Zeiss Milvis 135mm f2, another apochromatic lens. So let's take a look. So we're going to start by looking at both of these lenses wide open and I want to use a couple of optical benchmarks, uh, some of the very, very best lenses that I can throw this up against to demonstrate how you know sharp this Voigtlander really is. So uh, first of all, looking at the center of the frame, a couple of observations. Obviously, uh, magnification is a little bit stronger on the Voigtlander because it's got that extra 15 millimeters of focal length. You can see that in the center of the frame, both of these lenses are they're really exceptional. Um, just incredible sharpness and contrast. However, contrast does favor the Voigtlander a little bit. Um, it is better corrected as an apochromatic lens. It's better correct, corrected for any kind of chromatic aberrations. And so a byproduct of that is that it does have a little bit more um, wide open punch, actually an exceptional amount of wide open contrast. If we move off to the edge of the frame, you can see the Voigtlander's uh, sharpness profile really just, it goes right into the very corners of the frame. And, and so it is definitely stronger in the edges of the frame than what the uh, planar lens is. And that's true on both sides, um, you know, a, a nice centering result. And obviously we, the very edge of the corner is right off there. But obviously this is a very strong optical performance wide open. Now, if we stop the planar lens down to f2, a couple of observations. Uh, first of those being that we are getting a roughly equal exposure, maybe just a hair brighter on the planar, but you'll also see that it's metering to where it requires a little bit more shutter speed. So that speaks positively of the light transmission on the Voigtlander. So we're looking at the same result that we did before on the left side, but now we've stopped down to F2. We can see that there is definitely a noticeable uptick in the contrast on the planar lens, which now I would say is, is looking just as good and maybe even a hair sharper at F2 with it stopped down in the center of the frame. I mean, both of them are you know near perfect, but that planar lens is incredible stop down. Towards edge of the frame, the planar has also made some advances there, though on the left side, I do think that the sharpness still favors, particularly as you head up into that extreme corner, it still favors the Voigtlander, which is really consistent from edge to edge. And, and so um, a little closer here on the planar side, on the right side, but both of them delivering a strong result. Now, stop down to f2.8. Once again, you'll notice that the Voigtlander has asked for a little bit less exposure, um, or a little, I should say, a little bit faster shutter speed. And so again, yeah, that's less exposure. But you'll also note that it's delivered a brighter result than the planar lens. And so light transmission certainly favors the Voigtlander um, when it comes to that. And so, you know, faster shutter speed and yet a brighter image. Nice combination. Looking at the center of the frame, both of these lenses are perfect. I mean, you really couldn't ask for anything better than that. I mean, incredible detail and incredible contrast. They're having no problem keeping up with the 42 megapixels of the sensor here. Um, edge of the frame, both of them are really just, I mean, perfect. I mean, awesome. And so nothing to complain about there. And so as a, a benchmark here, you can see that this, this planar 50 millimeter f1.4 is, it is, I think it's the best 50 millimeter lens that I have used. I think that the Zeiss Otis 55 f1.4 is maybe a hair sharper, but not by any kind of significant margin. And so, I mean, that's really an exceptional result uh, from the Voigtlander. It has no problem keeping up and even exceeding the planar. 
As we move on to F4, we see the trend continues and that the uh, Voigtlander is delivering a brighter image even with a faster shutter speed than what the planar is. So light transmission is certainly a strength for the Voigtlander. Of course, we expect everything to look perfect here at this point, and yes, I mean, that's obviously what we see edge to edge. Both of these lenses are perfect. Now, I wanted to use one more benchmark uh, simply because I believe the, the Zeiss Milvis 135mm f2 lens, which is also an apochromatic uh, lens design, to be pretty close to optical perfection. And so uh, I wanted to see how the Voigtlander holds up against the very best. And in this case, it's a lens that costs twice as much. So I've used this via the Sigma, Sigma MC11 adapter. So, you know, XF data isn't perfect here. But anyway, uh, one other thing is that you can note once again, the Voigtlander continues to require less exposure than what the Milvis does as well. So looking here at uh, the center of the frame, both of these lenses are exquisitely good. You can see that the Milvis has just incredible levels of contrast. So it's kind of hard to pick a winner in the center of the frame. We move off towards the edge of the frame. And I'm going to say that I think the Voigtlander is a little bit better towards the edge of the frame. And, and yes, I understand that the uh, Milvis lens is an adapted lens. Uh, at the same time, I also note that my Sigma MC11 is, it's, it has very good tolerances and it delivers a very good edge performance. And so I just look at this and see that Voigtlander's had no problem keeping up with one of the very best lenses that I know of. Now moving on to um, f2.8, so stop down one stop for both of these lenses, we're going to see that for the first time we have an equal um, exposure value between two lenses, and I would say roughly an equal exposure that might slightly favor the Voigtlander, but not enough to be um, in any way significant. So, I mean, both of them are just fantastically sharp and very contrasty in the center of the frame. And moving off to the edge of the frame, I do certainly think that the Voigtlander is still the stronger uh, lens towards the very edge of the frame. And if we move back just a little bit to where it would remove any possibility of you know, the adapter being a factor, I would say that still the Voigtlander is delivering the stronger performance. And so, I mean, that is just downright impressive. Now here looking at the F5.6 version of the lens, we're mostly looking at distortion here. And so along these lines, you can see that we have a very, very little um, observable distortion, which of course is pretty typical for a macro lens. They need to have very low levels of distortion. And so uh, the practical value of that is, you know, manifest in a lot of different ways. So here is one practical advantage of having low distortion. This is a panorama that's a result of five different vertical images that have been combined together. And so having low distortion, even for something like landscape purposes, means that it's easier to get a seamless result as we have got here uh, from combining multiple images. And as we can see, this is actually shot on the Sony a7 III, so a little bit lower resolution than images we've just looked at. But of course, the end result resolution is exquisitely high and the you know, resulting image is really beautiful. Now here is a wide open F2 result on the a7R Mark III. So as you can see, the level of contrast in this image is just, uh, it's crazy good. And if we look in at a, a pixel level at this image, I mean, look at that detail. It is just incredible. And so this lens's ability to resolve in real world images is just incredible. Now, another incredible strength of this lens is that it has what I would consider very close to Otis levels of rendering in terms of the combination of three elements. Uh, number one is that resolution, and resolution here is, as you can see, incredibly good. I mean, just fantastic. The other is that incredible wide open contrast, which also reminds me of an Otis. I mean, if you look even in areas like this, that contrast level is incredible. And the final piece of that picture is just really, really incredible color rendition. And so the uh, the rendering from this this lens in an absolute sense is just, it's fantastic. And, and as I mentioned, when I look at images from this lens, frankly, it reminds me most of images out of the Otis 85 millimeter 
F1.4. I mean, just that level of goodness. Now here is more of a, just another real world shot showing that incredible contrast, but I mean, this on Sony bodies, nailing focus with manual focus lenses is pretty easy. And so byproduct is a, you know, a pretty uh, awesome looking image that comes out of there. Now here is for portrait purposes, and we're gonna get into the bokeh and rendering a little bit more in just a second. But as you can see, uh, very good color accuracy, so skin tones are nice and neutral here. And as you can see, the amount of contrast around the eyes and just in the face, skin tones, hair, is all really, really incredible. And so definitely a very usable portrait focal length. Here's a, another very, very adorable little girl, and this is just shot under you know pretty poor lights, um, just in an event setting. But as you can see, this is a little bit higher ISO, I think it's ISO 2000, but you can see how beautiful um, just you know the fall off is on skin tones, um, highlights, and the hair, you can see that just incredible micro contrast that has allowed all the little fine details of the hair to be rendered there. Really an incredibly beautiful result. Now to take a little look at flare resistance, a couple of things to note here. There is, this isn't a perfect performance. There's definitely some prismatic hazing and ghosting here, although it's not in, you know, kind of hard, definite patterns. We can also see, however, that contrast holds up exceptionally well and um, you know and so there's some pros and there's some cons there stopping the lens down we see that most of that kind of prismatic uh, haze has departed us although the ever-present um, sensor spots on sony's mirrorless bodies uh, persist even though i clean it constantly but i mean you look at those de the detail there and the contrast you know even with the sun you know pouring through this frame it's pretty impressive now, even with midday sun, um, you know, the birds were up here above. So, you know, I, I just I shot up towards the sun. It gives you a very good look at the, the blades there. So, I mean, and of course, detail there is, is fantastic. And here we go. There's that sensor spot. Anyway, uh, we can see that there is definitely, with the lens stopped down, there is still some prismatic haze there in that area, but at the same time, there's nothing that's overly destructive to the image here, and definitely contrast is unaffected. Now, of course, the added advantage of the Voigtlander lens is, is the fact that it does have a one to two times life-size magnification or reproduction value, so that's 0.50 times. The... Um, Plain R 50 millimeter has a pretty typical 0.15 times magnification, which you know is, is pretty common for a 50 millimeter lens. And so here you have minimum focus and maximum magnification from the Plain R lens, and of course here you have it from the Voigtlander. And obviously we're in a completely different kind of class here of performance. And so as you can see, uh, the Voigtlander, because it's an aprochromatic lens, its control of chromatic aberrations here is just, you know, it's, it's basically perfect. And the amount of detail that's rendered there, even at f2, is just exceptional. The, the planar lens is actually very good with chromatic aberration, but you can see it does exhibit a little bit of a green fringing, a little bit of an axial or longitudinal chromatic aberration that will show up here. So if we put the Voigtlander in the same position as that planar lens uh, on this particular shot, you can see that the green fringing that the planar struggled with is essentially non-existent here on the Voigtlander. And of course, looking towards these out-of-focus objects, I mean, there's just no fringing to attest to. It's just not there. Now, with both of these lenses at roughly the same, it's not the exact same distance, it's roughly the exact same framing. Um, and so I've moved back just a little bit for to accommodate for the extra 15 millimeters of the Voigtlander. You can see, of course, its ability to focus down so closely means that with both of them completely defocused, it's a very, very different result, you know, comparing them side by side. And, uh, but we're going to look a little bit closer at the bokeh quality from the Voigtlander here. But that just shows you the amount of defocus you can produce by comparison. And that's with the aperture advantage there for the, um, the planar lens. So if we put these lenses at roughly similar degrees of defocus at f2, now at f2 there is a little bit of an advantage here for the planar in that because it is stopped down, um, you're going to see that it delivers a little bit 
better across the frame circular shape. And you're going to see there is some cat eye or lemon shaped deformation, geometric uh, deformation of the Voigtlanders uh, towards the edge where it's beautifully circular. Um, on the planar stop down. And so that's, you know, that's something that will affect most lenses under this set of circumstances. Now what I can see on the Voigtlander that you may or may not be able to see on your own screen um, due to YouTube, YouTube compression is that there is a very mild amount of concentric circling or onion bouquet in this circular, circular shape. It, as I mentioned, it's, it's not particularly strong, but if there is any optical weakness of this lens, it's so well corrected that I would say that the bokeh has a little tiny bit of busyness in some situations. Again, it's, it's very mild. Now, if we uh, step back a little bit here and we look at these from basically the same distance, first of all, uh, let's look at our plane of focus. And I mean, just wow, wow, wow. That degree of micro contrast really from both of these lenses is just exceptionally good. And of course, the, of course, the Voigtlander is wide open doing that. That's just, that's just awesome. Now you can see once again, because the uh, planar stopped down, it's got an advantage in terms of retaining the geometric shape. The bokeh quality other than that is, is not really all that distinguishable between the two lenses. Now this particular image, I always like to shoot these kinds of images when I can. Um, and obviously this is a summer specific kind of image for me here in Canada. But uh, what I like about this is that it reveals a lot of things. I mean, for one thing, you get to see both foreground and background bokeh quality. And, and so, I mean, there's nothing really that's off-putting here. I will note uh, just that in this image, you can see a little bit more uh, some of that concentric circles or onion bokeh quality there. And it's, it's far from the worst that I've seen. And you're going to see it probably only in, you know, really pronounced type situations. But just note that it does exist. The other thing to note here is, of course, our degree of contrast is exceptional. And so, I mean, uh, you know, this area right here, look at those blades of grass and how incredibly they're rendered, even though this is an extreme lighting variance here in this kind of shot. So, you know, some good and bad take away, but mostly good. Now, this is the kind of image that a lens that does not control chromatic aberrations well really it has a hard time with. I've shot a lot of white flowers in bright conditions, images that look just absolutely terrible because of the way that it becomes smeared and indistinct around the edge and you know purple or green fringing. As you can see, the Voigtlander is exceptional in this regard. I mean, it just controls all those things so well. And that is the, the, the chief advantage of the apochromatic lens. And as you can see, I would say that the bokeh quality is, is, is nicely artistic. It is very, very slightly, very slightly busy. Um, not in, in any kind of extreme way, but in a very mild way. But you know, overall the image, I would look at that and say that's a beautiful image. Now at this kind of distance here, I think that the Voigtlander is really an exceptional lens. I mean, just because it has such a beautiful micro contrast and color rendering, you can see the, the great three-dimensional pop of our subject and you know, wide open here looking at a pixel level, 42 megapixel pixel level. You can see the amount of detail there is just exquisite. And looking at the image at large, you know, you've got a nice transition to defocus. It's just a, it's a beautiful result. Now at macro distances, the lens also continues to resolve as you would expect uh, very, very well. And you can see just great detail rendering uh, that is there. You know, a very, very narrow plane of focus here, but we can see just amazing uh, sharpness from it. One final image to share with you, just because, mostly because I love the image itself. And uh, I just took this this last week. And so this is obviously at sunset, but you can see that the lens has such gorgeous, gorgeous color rendition and uh, just has done a, a beautiful job with this. And, you know, of course, lots of detail, you know, even in the fine detail in the hairs that are there, it just really is a, a beautiful result. When I look at the optical performance from this lens, what I'm really reminded of in many ways is a Zeiss Otis lens. This is a lens that seems to have a lot of that Otis DNA in it. And of course, there are those that believe that Cosina, who is the company that manufactures Voigtlander lenses, 
is also responsible for building a lot of the Otis lenses. I can't verify yay or nay when it comes to that, but I can tell you that in terms of this incredible sharpness, resolution, micro contrast, uh, color accuracy, uh, just the, the feel of the images is very reminiscent to a Zeiss Otis lens. In a lot of ways, I'm most reminded of the Otis 85mm f1.4. Now, of course, this also lens also shares the single optical shortcoming that uh, that lens has, or, you know, for that matter, you know, the 55mm f1.4, and that is that it does suffer somewhat from what you might call some onion bokeh, or some uh, concentric rings within uh, bokeh circular highlights. Now, as we saw, it's, it's not pronounced in most images. In most images, the bokeh quality is very nice, soft, pleasing, it looks good. But you will have some situations where there are very bright circular highlights where you'll be able to see some of those concentric rings or onion bokeh in it. Beyond that, however, there is literally nothing to criticize. This lens is optically very near the top of the heap. And of course, of all the lenses that I might compare it to, I would say that it is the most reasonably priced at $999 US. And so this certainly is probably one of the lowest points of entry for an aprochromatic lens, and yet it delivers the optical performance equivalent to lenses that cost, well, many times over. And so all told, that makes this a very impressive optical instrument. Stay tuned for my final review and I'll come back with more coverage. I'll look at it a little bit more as a video lens and give you some footage there as a part of that. And uh, then just kind of my general thoughts on using the lens and kind of to recap all that we have looked at in these first two episodes in that final review. In the meantime, if you look in the description down below, you can find a link to my ongoing image gallery that I'll be adding to as I continue throughout this process. You can also find linkage there if you would like to purchase one for yourself. And of course, if you haven't already, you can follow me there on social media, become a patron. And thanks to all of you who have become patrons. And of course, if you haven't, please click that subscribe button here. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.